Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. As climatic conditions improved after the Younger Dryas, southeastern Anatolia developed into an area rich in living resources. The wild seeds of both agriculture and human civilization were blooming, as the foundations were laid for new pre-pottery Neolithic centres. Gebekli Tepe is one such settlement that's captured the imagination of the world, with its enormous size and scale, with its incredible monumental architecture, and the fact its radiocarbon dates go as far back as 11,500 years ago. This has led to Gebekli Tepe being called the zero point of history. But even though this settlement rose to prominence at the turning point in the world's climatic history, like every great ancient settlement and civilization, it was eventually abandoned, sometime between 8241 and 7795 BC, around the time of the onset of agriculture. You wouldn't call it a city or even a town, but something akin to a large village, and for its time it was a large-scale settlement and it thrived for around 1,500 years. But why did Gebekli Tepe come to an end? More than a decade ago, it was theorised by archaeologist Klaus Schmidt that Gebekli Tepe was a temple, a ritual site that was purposefully buried at the end of its life, an idea that's been repeated by popular authors and the media time and time again as a soundbite to help sell the mystery of Gebekli Tepe. Best-selling author Graham Hancock has helped propagate Klaus Schmidt's theory to the masses by appearing on popular podcasts like Joe Rogan. Yeah, yes, years deliberately years. buried. Again, I cite Klaus Schmidt. He, he's the authority on this. They were deliberately and meticulously buried beneath an artificial hill of earth and rubble. That it was deliberately buried. To pour over the top of them and completely bury them, though leaving them standing in place. Although I don't agree with his views on the site, Hancock has done a great job of raising awareness of Gebekli Tepe to a large audience. But because the average person with a passing interest is unlikely to read new archaeological papers, the ideas of Klaus Schmidt continue to be repeated even today. Although the theory by Klaus Schmidt was once very much a fair interpretation of the archaeology, for a site like Gebekli Tepe, hypotheses, ideas and theories can't really be accepted as fact if research and analysis is ongoing. And as we know, there is still a huge amount of work to do. Archaeology is not static. It's an evolving art and new discoveries, new analysis and new technology can often change the narrative. But sadly, because archaeologists are not invited onto the big podcasts, and because the History Channel would rather make a clickbait show pretending every ancient site was made by aliens, there is a real lack of popular outlets for the new information. Is it possible that primitive hunter-gatherers could have built such sophisticated megalithic structures? Ancient astronaut theorists say no. So, I am trying to fill in this gap and so, to start at the beginning, why did Klaus Schmidt think Gebekli Tepe was a temple site? Well, there are two reasons. Firstly, there was a lack of domestic finds in the early excavations that he led. And secondly, his belief the enclosures were ritually filled in by human hands. In basic terms, those two observations led to a ritual interpretation. But the work of archaeologists in the past decade has changed this. It has been shown that there is without doubt a strong domestic element to Gebekli Tepe. There's a cistern for holding water, around 8 metres wide and nearly 3 metres deep, a number of small basins across the site, and channels dug to transport and direct water. There are dozens and dozens of stone and bone tools, more than 10,000 grinding stones have been discovered, and there is also evidence of bead production. There are clear domestic structures, some of which have subfloor human burials, and these are built around the famous circular enclosures. 
Although it was believed that these domestic structures all came later, more recent excavations in the northwestern part of the site show domestic structures dating back to the early occupation stages of Gebekli Tepe, the early 10th millennium BC. It's now close to impossible to argue against the idea that Gebekli Tepe was a settlement. The archaeology does imply it was. So the first reason to assume Gebekli Tepe was a temple is wrong, because there is a very strong domestic element to the site. Then we come to the next reason why Klaus Schmidt believed that Gebekli Tepe was a temple, and that's his theory that this site was ritually buried. I've actually covered this in two recent videos, but I would like to point you to three publications, all of which I've linked below. The first was published in 2019 by Dr. Lee Claire et al, titled Gebekli Tepe UNESCO World Heritage Site and Changing Approaches. The second is a fantastic update on the site from 2020, again by Dr. Lee Claire, which looks at the research that's taken place between 2015 and 2019. The third paper is called Closure of Gebekli Tepe Erosion, and this looks at the evidence regarding the reasons Gebekli Tepe went out of use. In recent years, a lot of the research at Gebekli Tepe has not just gone into the famous pillars, but it's gone into the fill of the enclosures. Was Klaus Schmidt correct that they were really deliberately filled in some kind of ritual as the structures were closed? in the same way we bury the dead. Well, a full review of all the available evidence now suggests it's not the case. It looks like an inundation of material from adjacent high-lying knolls and slopes of the mound. This is why the fill of the enclosures contains a mix of older and younger material. The fill inside the enclosures looks to have been deposited by multiple slope slide events, and that may also be why a wall was built around the remaining circular enclosures to hold back the soil, the waste products and rubble. All of the buildings did not go out of use at the same time, but this was spread out over many centuries, with the tops of some of the T-shaped pillars still sticking out of the ground as life went on for the inhabitants of Gebekli Tepe. In these pictures we can see clear sloping layers within the fill, each layer consisting of a sediment with a specific grain size, some layers being fine soil and some containing coarse stones, and you wouldn't expect to see this layering if the enclosures were filled in in one ritualistic act. You would expect the fill to be more homogeneous. The cause of the fill is therefore natural, caused by soil erosion, one of the oldest environmental problems in the history of humanity. With Gebekli Tepe being a large settlement on a sloping hill, the structure of the topsoil would have been deteriorating since day one, and added to by human domestic activity. There would have been dumps of waste products, piles of stone chips and dust, discarded bones, food waste, ash and embers, broken objects, tools and weapons and so on. This would all have been deposited within the soil. The natural erosion of the land comes from water and wind. It's enhanced by deforestation and the removal of shrubs, plants and grasses. Land cleared from building projects. From human and animal behaviour, overworking the land and overbuilding and so on. Even if the land beneath Gebekli Tepe was only gently sloping, in time, with huge amounts of human activity, the soil could well become so unstable that it was no longer a sustainable place to live. The forces of wind and rain would lead to the topsoil creeping further and further downhill, and large freak rainstorms and tectonic events like earthquakes could have periodically destabilised the knolls and slopes, and this would cause much destruction. These events could have continued for centuries, until eventually reaching the point of no return. The warming climate after the Younger Dryas was drastic, but after the initial temperature rise, changes continued at a gradual pace, so that throughout the 1,500 years of life at Gebekli Tepe, there would have been climatic changes that could well have aided soil erosion. New constant challenges for the people that live there. 
nature did begin the filling process of the circular enclosures, but it's also very possible that humans finished them off. But that's because the site was still active when the enclosures were being destroyed by nature, by natural soil erosion. Finding an enclosure half filled with soil, whether gradually or after a storm, knowing it's a process that would only continue and get worse, well, once the enclosure was deemed a lost cause, it would make sense for humans to finish the job, and levelling the ground surface by filling the enclosures to the top. In time, it's very possible that the site as a whole was no longer a prime location for habitation, and people would have begun moving to lower altitude regions to resettle, these being more convenient for water for agriculture, and with more stable foundations to build on. The higher ground of Gebekli Tepe gave many benefits to the hunter-gatherer communities. You can see for miles around spot herds of animals as well as enemies. It is a strategic location, and it would be the perfect place for hunter-gatherers to first settle. But it's really just natural evolution that humans left this site one day, especially with the onset of agriculture. Simply put, Gebekli Tepe was not a sustainable site, but it is a perfect example of a perfect first settlement for a hunter-gatherer community. It's like a transition site in the human story. From a hilltop position, people could continue their traditional food sourcing practices, but it also allowed for new ones to develop. But it was inevitable that a settlement of this size, in this specific location, could not be sustained forever and sometime between 8,241 and 7,795 BC, life at Gebekli Tepe came to an end. It wasn't a ritual abrupt ending, but it seems to have been a gradual demise, and the human story then moved on to a new chapter. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.